Let me bring in Shadow Defence Minister Andrew Hastie. He joins us live from London. Thanks for joining us, Andrew. Appreciate your time. Firstly, when you look at what's going on in Gaza and the ground incursion by Israel to root out Hamas, what do you expect to unfold in coming days? And is there any way to minimise civilian casualties? Well, this is really tough. Um, we know what happened on October 7th. That is a barbaric terrorist organisation. Hamas attacked innocent Israelis and slaughtered men, women and children. Israel has to respond. And the task for Israel is to destroy Hamas completely. Uh, that's very difficult because, of course, Hamas has so enmeshed itself uh, amongst the Palestinian people in Gaza, which makes it a very tricky operation indeed. Uh, but Israel's response is, is, is just and uh, I'm sure they're doing everything they can to minimise civilian casualties. The mission is, of course, is to recover those hostages and destroy Hamas. Uh, it's good news overnight that Israeli special forces were able to recover a hostage. That would have been a very difficult operation to conduct. Um, let's hope we can find, they can find more uh, Israeli hostages alive. So we're talking about a door-by-door, building-by-building, tunnel-by-tunnel operation, uh, which will be very dangerous and deadly for the Israeli Defence Forces as well. But uh, surely the problem here is that Hamas won't allow civilians to evacuate south. If all the civilians could evacuate south, then they would be out of harm's way. Hamas is guilty of a war crime, and that is using civilians, innocent Palestinian civilians, as a shield. And... Uh, that makes it very, very difficult. And it's young Israeli men and women um, in their late teens, early 20s, who have to find their way through an infinitely complex battlefield uh, and, and, and use discriminate fires to, to kill Hamas and destroy uh, the movement. And that's going to be very, very difficult. We can expect casualties on both sides. Uh, but that should not obscure the fact that it was Hamas who started this. Hamas used paragliders, motorbikes, vehicles to get into southern Israel and murder people in the most horrible way possible. They want to destroy Israel. And so Israel has no choice but to destroy Hamas. And that's why uh, we find ourselves in this situation now. Tell us about the diplomatic response, your thoughts on it, what we've heard from countries around the world, from the United Nations, from so many leaders, where all the pressure, all the diplomatic pressure is put on Israel to be constrained in its response, to uh, in, uh, invoke a ceasefire, all the rest of it. Surely the call we should be hearing from in unison from every country and leader in the world is for Hamas to immediately release every one of the hostages it's taken. Surely that is the first <laughs> stepping stone in this process. I think you're dead, you're dead right there, Chris. Uh, <laughs> this would very quickly be resolved, at least partly, if Hamas were to release the hostages. They take an innocent Israelis, little children, little children who were taken from their parents and are being held by Hamas. Uh, if, I, I don't see any other way for the Israelis but to go after them with force. Um, so the international community, through its diplomatic pressure, should be applying that pressure to, to Hamas to release those hostages. You're absolutely right. The letter from the six former Australian Prime Ministers was strong and it was fair and it was compassionate. What is your take on former Prime Minister Paul Keating not joining in that letter? He can explain himself to the Australian people, but I thought it was a very odd omission from him. Uh, it was great to see... Malcolm Turnbull, Tony Abbott, two old rivals uh, pulling together in the national interest and for justice by condemning Hamas and expressing support for uh, the Israeli people. I thought that was an excellent example and, and it really does highlight Paul Keating's omission from that letter. But isn't it the case also that the language in that letter was stronger and clearer and it coming from two former Labor Prime Ministers in Julia Gillard and Kevin Rudd. Kevin Rudd currently Australia's ambassador in the US, yet their language was stronger and clearer than anything we've heard from the serving Prime Minister, Anthony Albanese. <laughs> You're absolutely right, Chris. Uh, the fact that former Prime Ministers from both sides of the aisle were able to overshadow Anthony Albanese and Penny Wong and Richard Miles is quite an achievement, I've got to say. And it just shows that Labor's instincts on this issue are all over the place. Anthony Albanese has been distracted. Um, his instincts are weak on national security. Penny Wong's tied herself up in knots. 
Richard Miles has been pretty solid, but generally speaking, he's not exactly got great instincts on this either. And um, you've seen what's happened with the Labor cabinet over the last few weeks. Never mind what's happening domestically, not just in Australia, but across the West with the moral equivalence and the nuance and the context. Uh, we even rem you remember what the UN Secretary General said that uh, oh, yes. didn't happen in a vacuum. I mean, Disgusting. which is just disgraceful. Just disgusting. Look, I would differ in your assessment to one degree. I would say that Penny Wong and Anthony Albanese have been strong on foreign policy so far in the way they've stood up to China and in the way they've been strong on the US alliance through AUKUS. But yes, this has exposed a weakness. There's been a mealy mouth response from Anthony Albanese. Isn't there a clear template here for him? Shouldn't he be directed just to read that letter from the former prime ministers and understand that that is the right positioning for this country? It's a pretty strong blueprint to follow. It's a pretty strong blueprint to follow for him. And uh, he, just, he just has to follow the bouncing ball. There's a lot of collective wisdom from those prime ministers. And I think he should take that and run with it. It's a gift for a guy who is looking for an answer. And why hasn't he spoken with Benjamin Netanyahu, the Israeli Prime Minister? That is a great question, Chris. Congressman Mike Johnson, who was elected Speaker last week, he was meant to appear here at the, the Alliance for Responsible Citizenship in London. One of the first things he did was call Benjamin Netanyahu as the newly elected US Speaker. Um, very, very odd that Prime Minister Anthony Albanese has not had that phone call yet. Do you think that this is reticence uh, on his part or on uh, Benjamin Netanyahu's part? I just think it demonstrates that this Labor government has dropped the ball on Israel. Israel is a very important friend and ally. It's a, a free people, a, a democracy in the Middle East, a, a villa in the jungle, as Ehud Barak said. And Anthony Albanese should have good communications with the Prime Minister. It's as simple as that. Just in the context of the conference that you're at, the Alliance for Responsible Citizenship, where you're talking about some of these issues, I, I wonder if you could finally just reflect on a point I made at the top of this program, that the way we deal with this issue at the moment and the way it's leading to anti-Semitism around the world and some obscene responses from some uh, leaders, isn't this more than a test of Israel and a test of Palestinian peoples? This is very much a test of our civilization. We are in a civilizational moment, and that's why the Alliance for Responsible Citizenship has gathered here in Greenwich. Um, we are affirming the good things about Western civilization. Truth, uh, justice, ordered liberty under law. And right now in the West, we've seen terrible moral equivalency arguments made about Hamas and Israel. And so what we're gathering here to do is to reaffirm uh, truth, and we find ourselves in a situation in the West where we can't even agree on a definition of what constitutes a man and a woman. Um, and if we're that confused, how on earth can we do grand strategy and take on some of the strategic challenges of the day, including a rising China, Russia, and what's happening in the Middle East? So we need to get back to basics. That's what ARC is all about. It's about getting back to basics. And I've got to tell you, I've been surprised at how many people have turned up here. Um, really, really encouraging. Great stuff. It's a, bit like the it's a bit like the start of the Sydney to Hobart yacht race. There's, there's boats all over the place. But once we're out past the heads with a wet sail, this thing will really take off and get moving over the coming years. Great stuff. We'll catch up with some other guests there. Thanks for joining us, Andrew. I appreciate it.